question. So good morning, everyone. Today I'll be talking about machine learning and natural language processing. So before I begin, just a quick show of hands. Who here has worked with natural language processing before? So I see about five or so people. Okay. So I hope that by the end of this presentation, I show that it is easy to get started with NLP and you'll be interested to start doing so as well. So natural lang language processing is the field of understanding language using machines. And I'll be sharing about language models and in particular the GPT-2 model released by OpenAI earlier this year. So I'll cover the basics of language modeling and the high level details about GPT-2. Then I'll demonstrate the fine tuning of GPT-2 and how we can create a language model with a wacky style. So don't worry if any of these terms seem unfamiliar to you. I'll be explaining them in the upcoming slides. So let us understand what language modeling is through a simple example. So here we have a sentence. The weather is great today. Let's go do something. So there's a blank in the sentence. There are many possible ways of completing it. So let's look at some possible choices. We can go cycling, we can go running, or we can go for PyCon. So all these choices are perfectly valid, but some seem more likely than others. And that is because of the mention of the weather being great. So we will more likely choose a physical or outdoor activity than an indoor one. So we can even assign probabilities to these choices. So say 50%, 40%, 10%. So what we just saw is an example of language modeling. So here is a formal definition of it. It's a probability distribution over sequences of words, or more accurately, tokens. So given some sequence of length m, we want to assign a probability of seeing that sequence. So again, if we look at this sentence, the weather is great today, um, we can look at it as a sentence of five words and a punctuation. Yeah. And in many cases, we want to actually solve a simpler form of the previous problem known as the engram model. So this is, it simply means to model the probability of the next word based on the past n minus one words. So you're just guessing the next word. So why is language modeling so interesting? I think so because um, writing is such an essential part of intelligence. So a good language model that can write creatively and coherently is highly interesting. And I'll show some interesting applications later as well. So let us now take a look at this short essay. So in a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. The scientists named the population after their distinctive horn of its unicorn. These four horned silver white unicorns were previously unknown to science. Now after almost two centuries, the mystery of what sparked this odd phenomenon is finally solved. So it seems like a pretty well-written piece of text that will fit into some fantasy novel. However, in actual fact, part of it is written by a neural network, GPT-2. So the first paragraph is a human written prompt, while the latter paragraphs are actually generated by the model. So there are some flaws with the text, but on first read, it certainly looks very impressive and certainly looks like something a human would write. The GPT-2 model actually writes a few more paragraphs after this, so you can find the full example on the OpenAI website. So, what is GPT-2? It is a language model based on neural networks created by researchers at OpenAI. So I'll share three key ingredients that make GPT-2 so effective. So they are generative pre-training, byte pair encoding, and a transformer-based architecture. So first, we have generative pre-training. That is where the name of the model, GPT-2, comes from. 
So the number two refers to an improvement over the original GPT model. So it is trained on a simple objective to predict the next word given some number of previous words. So this is exactly the engram model problem we saw earlier. So because of this simple objective, all that is needed to train the model is large quantities of text. Also, the nature of this objective means that this is considered a form of unsupervised learning since the data is unlabeled. The OpenAI team also created a new data set called WebText. So in order to ensure the diversity and quality of the data set, they made use of Reddit which is an online forum, and crop text from outbound links that received at least three upvotes. I mean, three comma. So comma in Reddit is the equivalent of upvoting. So by doing so, they utilize people on Reddit as a source of filtering and curation. So it ensures some level of quality determined by some humans on the internet as compared to randomly crawling text from the internet. And the last point is to use large amounts of compute in order to train a model with 10 times more parameters and 10 times more data as compared to the original GPT model. So this is a direct scale up of the previous model. The next point I want to share is byte pair encoding. So this is about how we represent our inputs when we put it into the neural network. So neural networks are unable to work with text directly. So before we fit in it into the model, we need to convert the sentences into a vector. So in order to do so, we must first tokenize our sentence. So here I will introduce three ways of tokenization, including the one that GPT-2 is using, which is byte pair encoding. So the most intuitive way of tokenizing a piece of text is to treat every single word as a token. So in such an approach, we create a dictionary of words that we see in the training text. However, we face issues during testing time when we see out of vocabulary words. So this can include typos and rare words. The good part is that the words are not fragmented during tokenization. So this allows the model to assign a value to the word more easily later. So example tokens we, will, we expect to see are common words, such as dog, cat, we. On the other hand, we have character level encoding, which is to treat every single character as a token. Since every word can be formed by chaining characters together, we are able to tokenize any piece of text and we will not face issues with infrequent symbol sequences since every word can be tokenized into its individual characters. However, such an approach usually leads to worse results since it is more difficult to learn the meaning of words when everything is fragmented. And the example tokens are basically all the alphabets of the language. So GPT-2 uses byte pair encoding which is an effective middle ground between the two approaches. So this is based on a work done in the 1990s actually. So when applied to NLP, we can combine the most frequently seen sequences of characters into tokens. So we get the best of both worlds, as common words remain unfragmented, while we are able to tokenize any piece of text, since every alphabet is a valid token as well. So we will also expect common prefixes and suffixes to be identified as tokens such as pre, re, un, yeah. And the third key ingredient I'll share is the neural network architecture, which is known as a transformer. So again, this is based on a previous work done a couple of years ago. So I'll try to explain this concept at a high level and not go too much into detail about neural networks or the actual architecture of transformers. So the major difference between the transformer and the previous state-of-the-art neural network architectures for NLP, such as the LSTM, is the attention mechanism. So one major problem before transformers was that it is challenging to learn long-range dependencies. So in other words, as sequences get longer, 
it gets more difficult to understand the entire sequence and make some prediction about it. So instead of making use of recurrence, the idea of the attention mechanism is to explicitly model the relation between every pair of words in the sentence. So this is a relatively simple idea, but the researchers who came up with it made it computationally efficient to do so. So this allows the model to learn to associate what each word could possibly relate to, so that it can learn complex forms of language relations. So let us take a look at another example. So here we have two sentences. The trophy doesn't fit into the brown suitcase because it is too large or small. So they are identical in grammatical structure. However, if we take a closer look at a sentence, um, it in both sentences actually refer to two different things. In the first sentence, it refers to the trophy, and that is because of the word large. And in the second sentence, it refers to the suitcase because of the word small. So this is a relatively simple problem for us, but it can be hugely difficult for machines because it requires some understanding of the world, such as a large object cannot fit into a small box. And this is a successful scenario that GPT-2 has resolved, where it could, most, where it could identify what it most likely refers to. So while there are many factors that led to this successful interpretation, I think it is safe to say that the attention mechanism played a big part of it. Okay, so enough of theory and slides. I'd like to show a demo of how we can interact with the GPT-2 model and fine tune it. Okay, so I created a Python package um, that you can easily pip install to play with the GPT-2 models. It is based, most of the work is based on the official GPT-2 re repo released by OpenAI and some fine tuning functionality from this person called Anne Shepard on GitHub. So you can easily install the package, you can see the usage and you can download the models with, the, with a command line tool that comes with the package. So there are three available sizes released by OpenAI. So they did not release the largest model because of ethical, because of ethical implications. They think that it might be misused. Um, so the, the numbers here just refer to the size of the model in millions of parameters. Okay, so to effectively play with the GPT-2 model, you need a GPU. And there are, if you do not have one, there are a couple of free GPU resources online. One of them is the Kaggle notebooks, and the other is Google Collaboratory. So you can try those out. So I'll show how we can play with it on Kaggle. So we can just install the package. So I downloaded the 774 million mod parameters model. And we can take a look at how the encoder works. So it's actually relatively simple. Underlying the encoder is basically just a dictionary mapping of tokens to numbers. So if we encode PyCon is awesome, you get this list of four numbers. And if you decode it, you can understand which, what each of this number refers to. So the first one is Pi, second one is Con, and so on and so forth. So let us take a look at a sample generated by the GPT-2 model. So this is random. I, so to generate it is relatively simple. It's literally one line of code. Just import it, sample it. Okay, 
K refers to how random it is. It chooses from the top 40 most probable options when create, generating the text. So this seems to be an article about China and um, about health. So it's talking about influenza and drugs. And it goes into detail about describing the drugs and stuff. And I think later on. Okay, so here it talks about a hospital in the city of Nanjing. So it, it is able to continually remember the context it is talking about. So it first starts with China and it continues to talk about a city in China. And it talks about a hospital. And later on, it mentions, it still continues to refer to that hospital that it mentioned earlier. And it kind of ex expresses it in a different way. So it kind of shows a bit of creativity. And it mentions about this doctor called Kuo Yichong, which is also a Chinese name. Later it also mentions this person again. So you can see that it is writing relatively coherent pieces of text. And here, I want to demonstrate how we can interact with it. So interacting with it is relatively simple as well. So, so just one line of code from the package. But of course, behind this line of code, there's a lot of, a lot more lines. It's a model built using TensorFlow. So I encourage everyone to try it out. Go read the code if you are interested. So let me try a prompt here. So this is the sentence that we saw earlier. So it's random. I do not know what's going to come out of it. So there are times where the samples might not be too great, but we'll see. Yeah, so I think over here it is not too great. Sometimes we find tokens like the end of text, and that is because of the way they train it. Um, so different data set points are separated with this end of text token. So it refers to like a change in topic. But if we look at the second part, I think the second part looks pretty decent. Looks like a pretty decent article. We can try again to see if the it can give a better output. <coughs> so this seems to be part of a novel kind of thing. So it's part of like something someone says. <laughs> I say it's, this one is better written. But it tends to do quite well in writing stuff that are like novel, like, you know, from books. So if I try this problem, Yeah, this is pretty well written, I think. So, sounds like something that will fit into a fantasy novel. Yep, we can try Hello World and see what happens. Something that we see a lot in our programming life. And somehow it seems to know that Hello World seems to relate Hello World to programming and coding, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
talks about windows and stuff. What is one plus one? One plus one? Yeah. Just because. <coughs> Seems to come out with uh, some mathematical formulas. I don't know whether these formulas are correct. <coughs> but I'm not going to verify it. But you can play with it and try it out in your in your free time. Okay, hold on. Uh, Let me load the next notebook. Take a while. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's random. So I think the question here is whether it is just memorizing text or writing creatively. So I'll try to show this in this example as well. That it's not just randomly memorizing text. Okay, it's kind of stuck. Yeah, give, give it a while to look. I couldn't preload two notebooks at once because Kaggle recently added a limit. So you can only have one running session at a time. <coughs> so I'll show something else while this loads. So you can fine-tune it with any piece of text you want. So here I showed the fine-tuning on Shakespeare. So you can find the complete works of Shakespeare online rather easily. It's free. So I just uploaded the complete works of Shakespeare's and I fine-tuned their 355M model. So if you are using the Kaggle notebooks, it has a 16 gigabyte GPU, um, which allows you to fine tune only the 355M. The 774M is too big to fine tune. Unless you have your own 32 gig GPU machine. So training is relatively simple as well. Just specify your data set path, the model you want to train, some steps and some other parameters. So one of the settings in this train function is that it will, um, it will generate samples as it trains, so you can see how it improves over time. So this is at step 1000, and this is the sample it generates. And at step 1000, it isn't too good yet, I can see more words. Hold on, I think it. Yeah, and in ca cases where it doesn't do very well, it tends to exhibit this behavior of repeating sentences. So you keep repeating the word fool multiple times throughout this um, sample. So it's a sign that it's not doing so well. If we scroll down, that was step 1000. Maybe let's look at, I don't know, step. Is this? Step 5000. So it starts to show 
a conversation between two people, one called First Lord and Second Lord. I'm not sure if these are actual characters in the Shakespeare. It's probably, it's prob they are probably actual characters. So, still shows a bit of repetition and stuff. Not too good yet. Like it repeats fellow, I know not, etc. If we go down all the way to the last sample it generates. So this is at the 10,000th step. So this took 9,000 seconds, which is about two and a half hours. So it's, I just fine tuned it on pretty short period of time. So you can do it for much longer to get better results. So, and it has things like exit. Because this happens in the actual training data set. Because most of um, Shakespeare's works are actually plays. So it talks about you have like this kind of annotations to represent that people need to leave the stage. So here there's a conversation between the king and queen. King talks about something about wind, and the queen talks about some wind stuff as well. There's some, I don't know, creativity here, I guess. And we can see if we can find this sentence in the text as well. I'm not sure, I haven't tried this out. So if we see, we can find it on the... So this is the text file of the actual train. <coughs> so this sentence actually never occurs in the entire Shakespeare's work. So it's kind of creative in that sense. Well, I, well, I can't judge how good this sentence is, because I'm not that familiar with Shakespeare's works. But I think it seems like a pretty good attempt. And the last thing... Huh. Thing is stuck. Didn't load. I'll give it one last try. If it doesn't load properly, I'll skip this part. But what I wanted to show is just interacting with the Shakespeare model. That I trained. <laughs> it takes a while to load. So, maybe let me show something else while this loads. So, go. So at this point, you might think that language modeling is just for fun, you know, and that the text might not be perfect and has flaws and times. But we can look at a couple of interesting applications. There's this group of people, tab 9 train the GPT model by giving it large amounts of code. So you'll predict the most likely ways of completing the sentence as you code. So um, there are large amounts of code available on GitHub, so you can just get it from there. And you can just predict how we can best, most likely ways of completing. So we can see that this can be a tool that um, increases our efficiency while coding. So it's a tool that helps us. So even in scenarios where it suggests poorly, we can still use our own judgment to write the correct code we want. And of course, the next 
and next example that most people will think of after seeing the demo is for writing. So Hugging Face made use of transformers to help suggest sentences in your essay. So this includes other transformer-based models and GPT-2 as well. So they actually have an online WordPad, so you can try it out yourself, how this works. So as you write, you can request for a prompt. It'll help you suggest ways of writing. So now, the teachers need a model to detect whose essays have been written by these models. So in both examples, we see applications of machine learning as a tool that helps us do something better. Okay, let me go back to this. Yeah, it is finally loaded. So I can copy a random sentence. And let's see how it continues. So it's a conversation now between this first gentleman and Sebastian. Yeah, and if we compare it, it is totally different from where I have picked it up from. So it's not just simply memorizing what is seen. So yeah, you can try it out uh, with your own data set and do some interesting stuff. I'll continue with the presentation. Let me just shut off. Okay, let us take at one more look, one more example of GPT-2. So the first paragraph here is a human written prompt. So recycling is good for the world. No, you could not be more wrong. So recycling is not good for the world. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for our health. Bad for our economy. Not kidding. And goes on and says many negative stuff. So even though the last couple of sentences are pretty illogical, since we will not normally associate recycling with health, but, but the point is that GPT-2 is able to construct um, these highly negative pieces of text. So someone who might not know better might believe that what this passage says is real because it is quite well written if you think about it. It's grammatically coherent and stuff. And, if, and I just showed like you can train it on Shakespeare's text. So you can influence the style of what the GPT-2 creates. So in a way, we can think of it being misused in various ways. We can use it to construct certain passages of text, like propaganda and stuff like that, or just as a fake news generator. So machine learning is becoming more powerful and impactful at an incredible rate. So there are many amazing applications that can be made out of it. Also, the potential for malicious usage is increasing. And the first step, I believe, to prevent such issues is awareness. And I hope that my talk today has done that. Okay, thank you. So, if anyone has any <coughs> questions for him, Attention mechanism. Yeah. So, uh, how, how did the model learn what the kit is referring to? In one case, it was referring to an object. In another case, it was referring to the space. Mm. So, how was it trained? Uh, there are no labels. It's all unsupervised learning. So, it's 
just a simple objective to predict the next word based on the previous n minus 1 words. In particular, it's previous 1023 words for GPT-2. So they input sizes of 1024, uh, I mean tokens of 1024 length, and then they just predict the last word. And uh, so that's how it's trained. And the second part is how do they test this out? So they, they will remove the word it and see what the machine most likely predicts. So it, in one case, it predicts like the correct object. I mean, in both cases, it, I mean, it's not, the prediction is all based on probability. So it just has the highest confidence that that object is it when you remove it from the sentence. Uh, this, yeah. Uh, we have two questions. I think you seems like you have already answered the first one because uh, okay, you have shown the use case for generation of new text. So I just wonder whether there is any other uh, use cases like text classification uh, that we can also apply this uh, GPT two. Uh, for text classification, you can definitely use GPT two as well, but there are also other models you can look at, such as BERT. I there's this bunch of models that's like named after Sesame Street, Bert, Elmo, etc. So those are actually they are trained more towards like supervised tasks. Whereas GPT-2 is trained on an unsupervised task. So you can fine tune it on a supervised task, but it tends to not perform as well as those models. Yeah. Uh, that guy where, uh, you may raise a question. The the guy behind. Okay, but uh, <laughs> Uh, we choose the model, we choose the model, so uh, is there any uh, common metric for the evaluation? No, there's a loss. Um, I can't remember the exact loss they use, but there's a loss value that they use. I think it's to determine like the difference between like the most from the text and like how it predicts, like the difference. Like, how different is it? its prediction from the actual text is trained on. Okay, uh, yeah. That lady behind. Uh, are there models to actually detect that uh, sentences are generated into it? Because it can be used to generate fake news, right? Yeah, yeah. So how do we actually uh, compare Yeah, I'm not sure about this, but there's definitely in other areas like computer vision, there's like generative adversarial networks that are used to try to detect try to find loopholes in computer uh, vision models. So in those cases, they can completely fool the model by changing maybe just one pixel in the image. So to a person, it looks like the exact same image, but to a model, it can change that category it predicts completely. So I would think that it's definitely possible. I haven't researched too much about it, but you, you would need the actual model as well. So you need to have a whole of the model. But if you don't know how the person trained it, it might be a bit more difficult to like try to detect it. Oh, that guy over there. Yeah. That's for the very informative uh, overview of the GPT-2. Actually, the use cases that you shared, right? It's like you're, you're given a prompt, and then you give you more about descriptive uh, writing or based on the prompt. Yeah. So is it possible that uh, given the a very detailed paragraph, can GPT-2 sort of summarize and then sort of uh, give us the G's? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Summarization tasks, I think they actually tested it out on summarization as well. I didn't show it, but I'm not sure about the details needed to make it summarize. Oh, I remember. Because the way they trained it on is like online text. So they append a TLDR token to the to a large paragraph at the end. And then they'll see, it'll try to generate a summary after that. Yeah. Uh, anyone or that guy over there? Hi, is it, um, so it's trained on like Reddit data, you mentioned, is that, is that right? It's trained on outbound links oh. from Reddit posts. So it's not just Reddit posts. Oh, yeah. yeah, so my question is, um, if you don't use proper English, let's say you use some mm. mixture of English sort of things, will it work? I mean, if you try it out in its op raw form, it probably won't work because it probably didn't see much of Singlish text. But if you find it, it can work. And also, yeah. Oh. Any more questions? Uh, yes. <laughs> so this is the unsupervised model. How do you evaluate the performance of the results? 
there is still an objective function. So even though it's unsupervised, it's unsupervised in the definition that the data is unlabeled, but there's still an objective function of the probability of seeing that word, the next word, given the n minus one word. So it's trained on that loss function. So it's like, uh, basically give that, that sequence and see how likely it's going to predict the same word in the training text. So you minim try to maximize the probability of predicting that same word. Okay, yes. That, okay. So how does performance compare to a Markov model? It seems a little bit like a glorified Markov chain. Uh, I'll say it seems to be much better. I don't think any Markov chain model seems to come close to this kind of quality of text generated. So I, I might be wrong. I am not definitely yeah. Any more questions? Last questions? <coughs> no? Okay, thank you, Jonathan, for your share. Okay, thank you.